I'm very happy that you are here. Now, my question is like, can you share your journey from being a research from uh, Middlesex University to the CTO of Zeroda? I was finishing my research. I greatly enjoyed my time at the university. I greatly enjoyed research. I got an insider view of artificial intelligence. It was beautiful. It was very enjoyable. But there was something inside me that I wasn't truly convinced that pure academics is what I wanted to pursue. As I was saying earlier, I think I said like a dozen times, I wanted to experiment with the things that I liked experimenting with every single day. So I wanted that freedom and liberty. And I came back to India because I'd gone there to study and when I was done with it, I immediately came back and I wanted to solve problems here. And coincidentally, I ended up in Bangalore. And because I had been writing software and experimenting for so long, I randomly got to meet people who were in finance. And I have no background in finance. However, this was around 2011-12. Uh, technology, consumer technology in India was picking up. We were getting smartphones for the first time. We were getting good little apps and whatnot, but there was nothing happening in finance. So that piqued my interest. And I'm always interested in experimenting and creating new little things. And that's how I ended up in finance from an engineering perspective. I wanted to build technology in finance because there was nothing else happening there. Didn't plan, it just happened. So my question is, how did you keep, how did you stay motivated and keep learning new things? Every day I wake up and I'm, I have this itch to do something new. Could be a small little thing, could be a programming related thing, could be something else. And over a long period of time, I've reflected and understood that it's intrinsic motivation. So I am extremely lucky that I wake up every day and there's motivation in me. But there can be external motivation also. And if you don't have that inbuilt curiosity, which just comes to you naturally to drive you, you can always look for motivation and curiosity elsewhere. Sometimes you look at stuff happening around you, you find motivation. Some, sometimes you can look at people who do things that interest you, you can find motivation there. So how do I keep motivated myself? It's very intrinsic. And when I build technology and I put it out there and lots of people benefit from it, now that is extremely joyful, that sense of satisfaction. The dictionary project I was talking about earlier, right? When lakhs of people use it on a daily basis and they derive value in their life from something I've created, that is immense motivation. So it's those things. I, my question is that, how do you think that A will change the way we live and work for the next 10 years? I think it's going to be very disruptive and complicated. I, earlier I was talking about junior people becoming seniors. You become a senior in any field after spending years of trying to figure out things on your own after gaining fundamental skills. But today AI can solve problems at a junior level across many fields which denies opportunities to human junior people across all fields, right? And that's a very scary possibility. How the world has functioned all this while, post the industrial age, it could change. So I think it's going to be very disruptive in the next 10 years. And I was stressing again earlier that that's why it's so important for young people to build their fundamental skills because AI is available to everyone. Whatever you can do with ChatGPT, everybody else can. So what is your edge? It has to be your intrinsic fundamental skills. So yeah, I don't really know, but I know that it's going to be very disruptive in the next 10 years. So my question is that, what path should I choose in order to pursue a career in robotics? Many pathways. If you think of school, high school, college, robotics, that's a very linear pathway. And robotics in itself is a massively complex, sprawling field. There's hardware, there's physics, there's software, there's artificial intelligence. Ro robotics is where all of these things come together, material sciences. So you need to try and understand what the possibilities are, what interests you. 
Robotics is not about going and putting together a robot. It's about all of these things. So you need to build a better understanding of robotics. And rather than thinking of school, college robotics as a linear pathway, try and understand what robotics is. Try and understand the millions of subsets it has. Figure out what interests you. Maybe it could be, I don't know, research on silicon. So figure that out and then see what leads you there. So you have to dissect that field. Robotics is too big, too wide. Break it down and understand what you like. So my question is, what sparked you the interest in computer science and AI and how did you pursue your passion? We had an electronics lab here, as I was talking about, sorry, as I said earlier, and tinkering with little gadgets, science experiments, and then tinkering with electronic circuits, it was a nice jump, slightly higher level. You could express your ideas in a more creative way. So I had that urge to always tinker and experiment. And we also had a computer lab here in the 90s, very old school. So from electronics, the jump to computers was even more natural. And once it clicked that you could write code and solve problems, problems around you using software, I think I was hooked and I've been obsessed ever since. So it was a very natural progression of the yearning to experiment, non-stop science experiments, to electronics experiments, then to computers. And then artificial intelligence is not something I had planned when I was in the university. It just happened to be that. But that decade worth of technology work I had done enabled, brought upon me that opportunity to pursue AI. And of course, it's a fascinating field. It has been forever. So I got interested and that's how it happened. But it's not something I had planned. So that was also AI research was a natural extension of my computer work in a sense. Can you discuss some challenges and opportunities in applying neural network to language tasks? Research. One component of my research was specifically about applying neural networks to language tasks. And uh, there are, I'll give you my favorite example. I saw the girl with the telescope. What does that sentence mean? Did I see the girl holding a telescope or did I see the girl with the telescope? What does it mean? You can't really know. So how does a computer understand when a human when a human can't decipher the true meaning of a sentence, how does a computer, right? So there are a whole lot of language, computational linguistics, language problems. And the older approach was to build technologies, neural networks, use neural networks, etc., et to solve these problems one by one. For that sort of a problem, certain kind of technology. For another problem, a different kind of technology. Like it was all over uh, decades and decades of research. But over the last four years, since the chat GPT thing happened, large language models, this one model, one big large language model can solve all language problems. But it doesn't mean that it can do it efficiently. Just to solve one sentence, would you run a massive data center of a massive AI plus neural networks? No. So each problem can be solved in many different ways. There are many different kinds of neural networks that can be applied to many different language problems. And ultimately, it's going to be a combination of small and big things that lead to language problem solutions. My question is, do you think AI systems can truly be creative? Or are they limited to generating variations of existing ideas or data? That's a debatable topic and it's a controversy everywhere. AGI, artificial general intelligence is when computers reach human level intelligence and I'm just saying it out for the students, uh, human level intelligence and computer intelligence becomes indistinguishable from human intelligence. Are our current AI systems, chat GPT, et cetera, close to AGI? I don't think so. Some people believe that to be the case, but I don't think it is anywhere near. But are these large language models as simple as pattern matching systems? I don't think so either. They're far more sophisticated, but not AGI yet. And although people have been saying that in the next two, three, five years, we will finally create AGI, I don't think it's that simple. And I think it'll take much longer. I have one more question. Nowadays, 
classrooms can be replaced by AI teachers. What is your opinion about AI teachers and conventional teaching method, which you are going to prefer? I, I was saying earlier, I use AI heavily every day. I have relentless questions about all kinds of topics. And AI as a tool is a good research assistant, but I don't think it's a good teacher. Uh, I don't look at AI as a teacher. I look at it as a research assistant with infinite patience and I keep asking questions, it keeps giving me answers. Answers may be wrong, it's up to me to figure out if it's right or wrong. But can an AI system or today's AIs replace a human teacher? I don't think so. AI has infinite knowledge. AI can teach you everything you want to know, but there's no mentorship. And learning is not just about giving answers and teaching. Learning is about sparking imagination, directing students, uh, opening up their minds. I don't think any large language model is capable of doing that. But do I use it as a research assistant? Absolutely, everybody should do it. Can it replace human teachers? No way. Not right now. <laughs> I heard you saying that you wanted to come back right, uh, right back to India after your studies. Uh, but in India, wider range of uh, people still think that they wanted to, they want to go back, uh, they want to go to abroad after studies or even for studies, wider range of people still think that that is the only, that is the right path to success. Uh, but you obviously wanted to come back. Uh, what uh, did you have a foolproof plan or was it a gamble? Is going abroad and getting a degree a measure of success? I don't think so. Uh, how did I end up there? Series of random events, won a partial scholarship. So circumstances led me there. I had no plans to go out and study. I didn't want to do a BTEC for specific reasons because I wanted a lot of free time, a lot of flexibility in the university or in the college to pursue my interests of programming and coding. And I figured that how the system in India works, if you get into BTEC, there's no academic flexibility. So that was one big impetus that drove me there. So I did my BSc. And then I was offered a PhD that was also completely unplanned. But from a career perspective, at that moment, once I finished my PhD, lots of opportunities opened up. Postdoctorate research, multiple universities. But to me, in my mind, maybe it was emotional, maybe it was social, I don't really know. It was extremely clear to me that I wanted to come back to India and whatever I did, I wanted to do it here. So I went there to study when the study was done. I didn't even plan to go there. It just happened, scholarships and whatnot. So when that was finished, I just came back. Also, I want to know that I'm sure they all want to know that. Uh, we have heard uh, systematic path is the way to success. So uh, we have heard most successful people saying that they have a work schedule, that they wake up at 4 o'clock and they um, meditate for 20 minutes, they read for 20 minutes. Do you have anything like that? Do you have a systematic plan? I think I was most systematic when I was in school, where you had to wake up at early hours and do whatever you had to do. And I think, see, this is an issue with the Indian society at large. Uh, the idea of success is largely artificial. You get a certain job, you build a startup, that's cool now, that's successful. I don't think none of these ideas of success are right. Uh, after being in the industry, technology, finance, etc. for so long, I think some of the many people, big people who are very financially successful, who are seen as the most successful people in India are very unhappy. I know many of them personally. Nobody's content in life. So... Nobody's satisfied. Nobody. It's, it's so few. I mean, the people who run this nation, the biggest industrialists, regulators, etc. from the government, many of them are just generally not content. So, school, college, job, that linear path, I'm not a fan of it. Is it to say that you shouldn't seek a job? Of course not. Jobs are necessary. We exist in a society, we need to make a living, we need to look after ourselves and our families. So, if it's a job, it's a job. But should you pursue your own interests and curiosity on the side? You sh should you put in a lot of effort to pursue your interests? Absolutely. Now, when those interests become something else, something beyond a job is not in your hands. But should you be content with just 
finishing your studies and getting into a job and just doing that forever, I don't think so. And I don't think it's good for the society, the Indian society at large. But unfortunately, our system is as such. Societal expectations, familial expectations are... It's high. Yeah, it's basically that. But you should always pursue your interests. Even if you have a job, even if you have to do it for economic reasons, on the side, you should pursue that. And you never know when something clicks. Most of us are using um, ChatGPT in everyday life. From my personal experience, uh, I found out that uh, when I was trying out some questions, I got the wrong answers. So, can you please tell me how far this uh, chat GPT is reliable? So large language models, the way they work, fundamentally, how the technology works, you can't figure out if it is 100% uh, right or wrong. You can ask it the same questions, it might give you a beautifully correct answer. But you ask it the same question five days from now, it might give you like an outright wrong answer. Which is why I was stressing earlier that you need to build those fundamental skills. The human, us, when we interact with ChatGPT and other LLMs, we need to use our critical thinking skills to figure out if the answer is right or wrong. So, I never seek outright uh, conclusive answers from these tools. I use it as an assistant to help me use my own fundamental understanding and skills to further it. So would I ask it a question and trust the answer it gives me? Absolutely no. I get an answer, then I go figure out that the answer is right or wrong elsewhere, be it Wikipedia, be it other primary sources. That's why I kept on saying that it's not really a guru or a teacher, it's a research assistant. It'll save you a lot of time, but you can't trust its answers outright. It'll give you an answer, then you have to figure out whether the answer is right or wrong on your own, for which you need fundamental skills, foundational skills. Does it differ from mobile to mobile, user to user? No. Uh, it uh, can vary from person to person. Person to person, the answer may be different. Yeah. So, may be very confusing, right? We won't know what is correct and what is wrong without any you can't. reference. So, you can't trust what AI tells you. It will tell you right answers 90% of the time. But if you trust it fully, and 10% of the time you don't know if it's giving you the wrong answer, it could be disastrous and dangerous. So, every time you get an answer, it's on you to go figure out whether it's truly right or wrong by using your skills and critical thinking. I want to take this moment to thank Dr. Kailash Nath for being with us today. It was an entire pleasure to have you with us. On behalf of all the students and staff, I sincerely thank you for participating in this interview session. Your thoughtful response, warm presence and the way you connected with our student was truly enriching, sir. You not only answer their questions, you inspire them with your journey and with your experience. Thank you once again for making this session so thoughtful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to say one last thing, which is we were here today felicitating uh, top performers and that's always amazing. But I'd like to dedicate this day, not just to top academic performers, but to the thinkers the tinkerers and the experimenters. Grades are important. That's how our system is. That's how our society is. So, rarely determine where you end up in life. And we can, you know, all my peers, all my classmates, uh, it's good to pursue academic excellence. We must pursue academic excellence. It's a matter of discipline, learning. But to think, to critically think and experiment and to pursue your interests, whatever it is, on the side, in life is far more important. So I dedicate this day to the thinkers, tinkerers and experimenters. Thank you. Thank you, sir.